<clears throat> All right, so tonight I am going to talk about section 4.2. 4.2 contains two distinctly different rules. There is an addition rule, and then there is a multiplication rule. The addition rule and the multiplication rule are very easy to confuse. It's one of the things that honestly makes this particular section uh, really one of the most challenging for my students in the entire book. Fortunately, if you do survive uh, chapter four, uh, the probability material does tend to get quite a bit more straightforward. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the addition and the multiplication rule. And this particular rule is going to involve compound events. All the material in 4.1 involve simple events. A compound event is an event combining two or more simple events. Let me give you a quick example. <clears throat> if we go ahead and flip a coin twice, <clears throat> or two coins once, and record the results, I might have two heads, a head and a tail, a tail and a head, and a tail and a tail. <clears throat> this is my sample space, and all of those guys in there are simple events. They're all of them, simple events. Now, the event that I am interested in here is the event A, where we have at least one head. So at least one head. And if I take a look at my sample space, that outcome, that outcome and that outcome all have at least one head. In fact, one of them has two. <clears throat> this is what we mean by a compound event. So A is a compound event. <clears throat> now, before I give you any of the rules for calculating probability, <clears throat> I wanna note that for most of the material that we see here in chapter in chapter four, there are a number of different formulas in play. That can be very confusing to students. However, each of our rules has a very common sense, what we like to call intuitive rule, <clears throat> intuitive sort of approach that usually works much better than blindly trying to use a formula you might or might not actually understand. So I'm going to give you the intuitive rule and the actual rule, and we'll work with them both. And we have one for each of these guys. It really works well for the multiplication rule, by the way. All right, some notation and some definitions first. First up is our addition rule. Now, it's really important to remember that when we're working with the addition rule, we're working with a single trial, maybe a single flip of a coin, maybe a single selection from a group. <clears throat> In any case, there is just a single trial involved. And you'll see this as we go through our example. Even though there's a single trial involved, there are two distinctly different events. There is events A and event B. And now, the notation we use looks like this, and it's important notation, the probability of A or B. You see this word or right there? That can be problematic <clears throat> because most people think of the word or as the exclusive or. <clears throat> do you want a hot dog or do you want a hamburger? You're certainly not going to get them both, but that's not what this or is. <clears throat> the probability of A or B means the probability of A occurring, B occurring, or perhaps both of them occurring. <clears throat> Here again, or means one, the other, or possibly both. This is what we call the inclusive or. <clears throat> and it does confuse students. So we're looking at a single event or single trial, I should say. And we're asking, what is the probability either the first event, the second event, or perhaps both of them occur in this single trial? 
<clears throat> now, having said that, there is a rather intuitive way of approaching this, but there is some subtlety here. <clears throat> if we want to find the probability of A or B, as soon as I see that word or, I realize I'm working with a single one trial, one selection. <clears throat> I might look for the number of ways that A can occur. I might look for the number of ways that B can occur. <clears throat> In other words, as we calculate a probability, we really want to calculate the number of different ways objects might occur or events might happen. <clears throat> However, we've got to make sure of one very important thing. <clears throat> Whatever it is we are counting up here for our events A and B, we want to make sure that each of those outcomes is counted only once. And that's very, very important here. And you're going to see that in my example in just a moment. <clears throat> Once we've done that, then we can divide <clears throat> the total number uh, and that value by the total number of outcomes. So that's your total number of outcomes. And <clears throat> this part here about the double counting really is an issue that needs to be addressed. I will be using the formula here because I think the formula for most students makes the most sense in the addition rule. So here is my formula. <clears throat> the probability of A or B occurring. <clears throat> I have a probability of A that I find. I have a probability of B that I find, but I cannot add them directly together. I have to consider subtracting the probability of A and B. <clears throat> the probability of A and B means that A and B occur together in the same outcome or trial. <clears throat> this is what we do to remove that double count. <clears throat> Basically, we look for any overlap where that might happen. So let me give you an example here. <clears throat> You'll run into a bunch of uh, problems very similar to this in uh, 4.2. <clears throat> We're going to make a random selection from this table. We did a <clears throat> we did a survey somewhere and we asked people did you vote? Did you not vote? You want to list yourself as male or female? And we have what we call a two-way classification table. And we're going to find the probability that the person selected is either a woman or voted. All right. <clears throat> so the one thing that we do uh, for pretty much every single one of these is to go ahead and find row and column and grand totals of everyone involved. So <clears throat> I might need my calculator, but the calculation is really straightforward. 36 plus 54, if I add those two numbers together, I get 90. 41 and 17, <clears throat> I get 58. 90 and 58 is 148. If I add my rows up, 36 and 41, that's 77. 54 and 17, that's 71. <clears throat> 77 plus 71 is 148. <clears throat> so I've got row totals here and here, and I've got column totals here and here. So if we're looking for the probability that someone is either a woman or voted, I'm going to pick notation that really helps. So by my formula, we have something that looks notationally about like that. 
<clears throat> so what we have is the probability of selecting a woman or someone who voted W or V, probability of W plus probability of V minus the probability of W and V. Now, if I calculate each of them separately, let's see what we find. <clears throat> the probability of selecting a woman. So if I consider that number, there are 71 <clears throat> women in this table. How many? 71 out of 148. Plus, now I'll find the probability of selecting someone who voted. Selecting someone who voted, they are in this first column right here. So selecting someone who voted, we have 90 out of 148. Now, we may or may not need to subtract a double count. It really depends on the table and on the question. What we're looking for is overlap, places where data might have been counted not once, but twice. I noticed that this number 54 went into the 71 total. It also went into the 90 total. So this 54 here, those 54 individuals were counted not once, but they were counted twice. So we have to subtract that double count. So we'll have 54 over 148. Let me grab a fresh sheet of paper here. I want you to notice that when the problem is set up correctly for the addition problem, addition probability, the denominators should all be the same. <clears throat> Usually adding fractions is kind of a pain, but not here. Here we have the same denominator. So the probability of W or V is equal to 71 plus 90 minus 54 divided by 148. So my calculator will figure that out. I'm going to jump over here to my other screen, <clears throat> my calculator screen, because I need to make a point about working your, with your uh, calculator uh, for problems like these. And there's a couple of very common mistakes that people might make. Uh, the, the fix is really straightforward. People usually do pretty well with the fix once they know what it is. All right, so there's my calculator. Where are you guys? Oh, there you are. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> yes, good evening, everyone. So let's see, let me share. Where's my, there it is. Okay. All right, so I need to add the 71, the 90, and then subtract the 54. So 71 plus 90 minus 54. Now, a very common mistake to make, depending on where you've come from and how long it's been since you've done math, is to try to divide that result by the 148. <clears throat> if one approaches the problem like this, one ends up with kind of a crazy number like this, 160 and change. Now you'll remember that a probability needs to be a number between zero on the low end and one on the high end. It can be zero, it can be one, but it's gotta be between zero and one inclusive. So what went wrong here? It was the order of operations. PEMDAS. PEMDAS instructs that we must do multiplication and division before any addition or subtraction. So it looked at this and it said, hmm, I'm going to do divide, then we'll take care of the add and the minus and stuff like that. So there's two ways around this. <clears throat> One is relatively advanced. 
you can use your grouping symbol, 71 plus 90 minus 54, close them up again. And then you can divide that result by 148. And now that is a number between zero and one, and it could very well be the correct probability here. And it is. <clears throat> but sometimes that's a heavy lift. I usually just instruct my students to take care of the numerator first. Find that value there, and then just come right over here and hit the divide. You don't need to do anything else. It will assume you want to use the 107 for your numerator, and you'll divide by 148, and there you go. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and stop my sharing for just a moment. Now I'm going to come back here to illustrate why this notion of a double count can be important. <clears throat> so we had 0 0.72297. I'm going to talk about rounding at the very end tonight. Uh, I'm going to take three decimal places. That means I've got to look at the nine to tell me what to do with the two. So 0 0.723. So that's the probability of selecting either a woman or someone who voted. Now, let me explain why that double count is so important. <clears throat> With no double count, well, not only will the answer be wrong, but we would have literally 71 plus 90 over 148 or 161 over 148, which is a number that is greater than one. That even, it just can't even be a probability. So because of that, <clears throat> because of that, we've got to make sure we remove double counts. Any questions on the double count stuff about why it's important? If you have questions, you can throw them into chat. You can unmute and shout them out loud. <clears throat> now, let me tell you about some of the subtlety that comes along with this particular, <clears throat> this particular process. Hmm. No, let me not start there. Hold on. One thing that can uh, adjust or uh, cause us to um, work with these uh, processes just a little bit differently is if the events in question are what we call disjoint or mutually exclusive. Disjoint or mutually exclusive events cannot happen at the same time, cannot happen at the same time. <clears throat> it's really an important concept and I'm gonna give you another example right now. So, <clears throat> if I flip a coin a single time and my event A is heads and my event B is tails, they cannot occur together in a single flip. <clears throat> If this is the case, the probability of A and B equals zero. <clears throat> so the probability of A or B would equal the probability of A plus the probability of B. <clears throat> but it's important to realize this happens only when a and B are disjoint. If not, then that last term, the double count is in play and we need to take that into account. 
Let me give you another example of where disjoint events come into play. We've actually already encountered them. <clears throat> I didn't make a big deal at the time. We actually had a lot on our plate, uh, but the notion of complementary events, A and this A bar, they are disjoint. <clears throat> I'll remind you <clears throat> that this particular event A is A bar, excuse me, is everything not in A, everything not in A. <clears throat> so those two things by definition are disjoint. They cannot occur together. They share nothing. There is no overlap there. They also span or cover the entire sample space. And I'll give you a very simple example in a moment, and then I'll give you a more numeric example. We have a, three distinct rules for complementary events, but in some sense, it's really just the same rule uh, recast a couple different ways. <clears throat> the probability of A plus the probability of A bar is equal to one. That means if I adjust this formula by subtracting the probability of a bar from both sides, I can rewrite this in this form. The probability of a is equal to one minus the probability of a bar. <clears throat> or nothing special about a and a bar, I can recast it for the complementary event as the probability of a bar equals one minus the probability of a. We actually use this uh, to some good effect for specific types of problems in section 4.3. So that is the rule for complementary events. Let me show you why it works the way it works. We have two coin flips. We'll have H, 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 T, T, H, and T, T. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's my sample space for my two coin flips. Now, here's my event A. <clears throat> at least one head. So in my sample space, that is my event A. I note that the probability of A is three out of four. Three out of four are the outcomes satisfy that requirement. <clears throat> What's left? This little guy here. That's the complementary event. No heads. <clears throat> Probability of a bar, one out of four. And I will note that the probability of A plus the probability of A bar is, <clears throat> what is it, three fourths plus one fourth four fourths or one. It's the entire sample space. And this is the reason we like this arrangement because you can get from one to the other pretty gosh darn easily because you know <clears throat> that they've got a sum to one. Here's another more numeric example. <clears throat> Across the human condition, the probability of sleepwalking is 0 0.92. 0 0.92 is the probability that a randomly selected person <clears throat> might be a sleepwalker. <clears throat> so I'm going to use this piece of information to find the probability of selecting at random someone who does not sleepwalk. Notice I've got P with the W with the little bar on top. <clears throat> I know P, <clears throat> the 
the probability of the complement of W is one minus the probability of W. I just plug in the values and I pretty quickly get to the 0 0.708. And this is the probability of selecting someone who does not sleepwalk. <clears throat> no sleepwalking. So <clears throat> two simple uh, examples of this notion of complement. We do use it again in um, 4.3, and there it can be a little bit more involved. I'll have some examples once we get there. <clears throat> now, there are two topics in this chapter, the addition rule and the multiplication rule. In previous editions, they were actually separated out into completely different chapters. <clears throat> and I'll attempt to give some sort of summary when we get done with the uh, 4.2 material here. Now I'm gonna talk about the multiplication rule. And it's important to realize that the multiplication rule applies to multiple trials or selections. So very important distinction. You've gotta read the problem carefully to pick up on the distinction. The addition rule, has a single selection or trial. The multiplication rule has two or three or four or more, at least two. Furthermore, we have complication in our notation too. When we're working with the multiplication rule, we talk about the probability of A and B. That means in this particular case that your event A occurs in a first trial or selection while that event B occurs in a second trial or selection. So it's really important to keep it straight in your head whether you've got an addition rule with one selection, whether you've got a multiplication rule where we make multiple selections. It's really, really important. This one has the potential to be fairly straightforward, but can be confusing. However, the intuitive rule for the multiplication rule really, really works well. Let me go through an example, a very simple example. I'm going to come back to my coin flip example, uh, where we flip a fair coin two times <clears throat> and I will note that uh, the event H is where we get heads on flip one and tails T is the event where we get tails on our flip two. So <clears throat> we're now looking at the probability of H and T. H is the first outcome of interest. T is the following second outcome of interest. We've got that word and right there in the middle. So <clears throat> how do I know I've got multiple selections? Right here. I've got a flip one I worry about. I've got a flip two I worry about. So there's two distinctly different trials in play. Now, <clears throat> if I take a look at my sample space, we just had it up here a moment ago, there is but a single outcome where we have a head on the first flip and a tail on the second flip. That's right there. In fact, let me do that in a contrasty sort of color. Oh, that one's going dry on me. So the probability of H and T in that order is literally one out of four. Now, let's decompose this a little bit more. <clears throat> if I take a look at a single coin flip, single coin flip, just one flip, any flip, the probability of a head on any one flip is one out of two. The probability of a tail 
on any one flip is also one out of two. So <clears throat> it's important to realize that this happens for any one flip. That's just the way coins work if they're fair. Now, if I take another look at it, I've got the probability of head on the first and tail on the second. If I multiply them together, I got literally one half times one half or one fourth, which is exactly the same as I got there. <clears throat> this is designed to convince you that finding the individual probabilities and multiplying them together might be a good approach. That really is the intuitive rule. <clears throat> there is a bit of a caveat, just like there was with the addition rule. This one is more involved and somewhat more subtle. <clears throat> so the intuitive rule for multiplication with multiple events here, <clears throat> to find the probability of A and B, we find the probability of A for the first trial, and we find the probability of B for the second trial, and then we multiply them together. However, there is a very important caveat, and this is where the subtlety of the situation comes into play. We want to make sure that when we calculate the probability of B, <clears throat> we assume <clears throat> that event A has occurred. This might or might not have an impact. And this is what is important and subtle about the multiplication rule. I'm gonna put the formula up here. <clears throat> and I'm going uh, to go through the actual formula and we're going to work with a couple of different examples. Some of them will be very simple. A couple of them will be a little bit more involved. I think it really depends on our time. <clears throat> yeah, I think we'll get them in. Now, the probability of A and B occurring, that's A on the first trial, B on the second, is the probability of A times this guy right here. <clears throat> this is the probability of B given A has occurred. <clears throat> it's weird notation, that's a single vertical line, kind of like half an absolute value that got itself lost in the woods. So we have the probability of B given A. This is the probability of B given, this is the important part, A has occurred. And it's an important notion here. Now, I need to offer up an example or two to get this point across. This one's really kind of a silly contrived example but it works very well for explaining this notion. <clears throat> First off, before I go ahead and explain that notion and run the risk of confusing you completely, I want you to remember, there are certain circumstances, quite a few of them, honestly, where a simple multiplication of easily computed probabilities is what we want. This happens an awful lot. So, as I say, to illustrate this, we need a particular sort of example. And we need a special concept. So let me introduce the concept first. We have this notion of something called independence. 
and I'll write this down. I'll actually write it down and like using real words, you'll see me write it down with my pen. I think it's that important. So independence and the multiplication rule. Ah, I think I'm gonna put parentheses around that. It's so freaking important. All right, so here's my little contrived example. We're going to consider a bag of beans. You can't see in the bag, but we've got a bag of beans and that bag of beans has six red beans and four blue beans. So the question is, well, how many are we going to pick? And the answer is we are going to pick two. We're gonna pick two, but there's an important consideration. The important consideration is how are we going to pick the two? <clears throat> Let me explain what I mean by that. We're gonna reach into the bag two times because I've got to pick two beans. That part seems clear. However, <clears throat> I need to distinguish between two different ways I might make the selection. I might make the selection with replacement. <clears throat> I'll take a first pick and then I return the bean to the bag before the second pick. Or I might do it without replacement. <clears throat> After my first pick, I keep my B and it does not go back into the bag. Now, obviously, if something is returned back into the bag, it might be picked again. Quite clearly, if something is not put back in the bag, it has no chance of being picked again. <clears throat> so we can sample with replacement or without replacement. And we need to distinguish between those two notions because there can be there can be numeric difference between the outcomes and the probabilities. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and bring in my last example, and then I'll attempt to define independent, dependent, and give you some kind of uh, some kind of summary here, and then we can talk about rounding uh, probabilities. <clears throat> All right, R is the uh, event that the first bean selected is red. B is the event that the second being selected is blue. R and B, rhythm and blues, I guess. <clears throat> so there were six red, four blue. That means I've got a total of 10 beans in my bag. So I am looking for the probability of a red bean on the first and a blue bean on the second. Now, if I sample with replacement, really important here, we're doing it with replacement. And so the probability of A and B, I'll find the probability of A. How many beans are in there? 10. How many of them are red? Six. <clears throat> I've got a typo there that bugs, hold on. R, 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 gosh, R. See, A kind of looks like an R here. Anyway, <clears throat> there's six out of 10 of those beans are red. So six out of 10 is the probability of selecting a red bean on the first selection. We put our bean back in the bag. So there's still 10 beans in that bag. I reach back in <clears throat> for the second selection, and we wanna know what is the probability that the bean is blue. There are four out of 10 blue beans in that second, in the bag for the second selection. So six out of 10 times four out of 10, that's 24 divided by 100 or 0 0.24. Now, Suppose I do this without replacement. So <clears throat> this time without replacement, 
when I reach back in, probability of R times the probability of B given R has occurred. So, it matters here because we're doing this one without replacement. So when I reach back in that first time for my first red bean, there's 10 beans in there, six of them are red, six out of 10. However, when I reach back in the second time for the blue bean, <clears throat> there's only nine beans in there because we've sampled without selection that changes your denominator. That's 24 over 90 or 0.267 when you round. So you can see that these two values are not the same. <clears throat> Here's the problem. This guy here is painful. Sometimes you make multiple selections like 10 or 100 or 1,000. This comes into play when you make selections from a population. For example, if you want to select 1,000 people from a population of 1 million, well, there'd be 1,000 out of a million for the first selection, 999 out of 999,999 for the second. It's really awful to try to set up that kind of problem. And therefore, we have what we call the cumbersome calculation rule. And that's for the multiplication rule. I'm even going to give you the page number. Uh, you know, it's really funny. In statistics, we have a number of workarounds when, yeah, the answer might be slightly different, but I think the uh, saying is the juice ain't worth the squeeze. I think that's the saying there. So let's see, the cumbersome calculation rule that lives on <clears throat> almost, oh, I'm sorry, I went right by it. <clears throat> it's on page uh, 152, there you go. And basically it says, uh, if the sample is less than or equal to 5% of the population size, try that again, assume events are independent. Now, I need to give you an, a real good definition of this notion of independence. Oh, let me come back here. <clears throat> now, When I did this calculation the first time, when I did this, the uh, calculation with replacement, and I came in to make my second calculation, the probability of selecting a blue bean from that bag, four out of 10, it was as if the first event had never even happened, never even happened, didn't change the result at all. That's because A and B here are independent. Over here, when I made my selection without replacement, I had to adjust that second fraction <clears throat> because of what happened in the first selection. The assumption is you actually get the blue bean. I know it seems a little weird, but that's the way you calculate the probability here. It's six out of 10. It's not one for one. So painful here. 
Here, A and B are dependent. So let me give you a definition and then we'll summarize and wrap up. Events A and B are independent if the occurrence of one does not <clears throat> affect the probability of the other. So events there are independent, and this is the important part, if the probability <clears throat> is not of that second event is not affected by the occurrence of the first event. It's a subtle point, but it's an important point. Let me give you an example. Well, let me, uh, <clears throat> let me tell you about dependence. <clears throat> If the probability is affected, A and B are dependent. Again, <clears throat> if the probability is affected, for the uh, other outcomes, then those events are called dependent. Let me give you a couple of examples of independent and dependent events. Independent. Coin tosses. That was why I was able to multiply the one half times the one half to get the one fourth. Because my coin for the second toss really doesn't care how it landed on the first toss. Coin tosses, uh, dice rolls, <clears throat> those are all independent. They don't care what happened before. Each one is utterly unique. Coins and dice have no memory. Dependent. This is when we sample without replacement. That is your big example of where we have dependent, dependent types of events. So, <clears throat> So let me go ahead now and summarize, I think we're there, the addition rule and the multiplication rule. So, addition rule, one single trial. Probability of A or B, probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability <coughs> that they occur together in a single trial. This reduces to probability of A plus probability of B when A and B are disjoint. <clears throat> then we have the multiplication rule. <clears throat> multiplication rule, two plus trials.
I can multiply the probabilities together directly <clears throat> when A and V are independent. <clears throat> I use this formula and I adjust the second probability when A and B are dependent. <clears throat> so there we have it. That brings me to the end of my discussion for <clears throat> uh, 4.2. Take a look at the uh, <clears throat> lecture summary and technical detail. I've got video in there of all of these types of problems being worked out. So that should be fairly straightforward. <clears throat> any other questions i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording there we are just about out of time <clears throat> let me go ahead and uh, switch back to the uh, other screen and then we'll go ahead and get go let's say goodbye and <clears throat> so there we have the detail for section uh 4.2 um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in 4.2, Gloria. Students really do find it uh, challenging and frustrating, uh, and that's understandable. Uh, it's important to realize that it doesn't start there in probability and get worse. Now, the probability stuff cleans itself up pretty nicely. And getting a hold of a probability is usually um, usually uh, down to picking the correct calculator tool, uh, which we spend a lot of time on doing. So I'm gonna go ahead, stop the recording, and I'll say thank you.